Welcome to the T2 Hubcast. Join Martin, Dave, Spencer and guests as they discuss all things personal and professional development. The T2 Hubcast, brought to you by the People Performance People. So welcome back to the T2 Hubcast with me, Martin Johnson. And me, Dave Pendleton. David, how was your weekend? Um, unusually quiet. We didn't do very much this weekend, you know, just stayed in, chilled out, took it easy. <laughs> as as per the last eight weekends. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, listen, mate, we're, we're on week commencing the 4th of May. We've been in lockdown six, six and a bit weeks, maybe seven weeks now, and we're expecting an announcement this Thursday, aren't we? So, um, fingers crossed there'll at least be some light at the end of the tunnel by the end of this week, eh? Aye, uh, let's hope so. Bit of freedom of movement would be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, you don't sound convinced. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's a bit like Groundhog Day, isn't it? It is. It is. <laughs> but we're making the best of it. And um, we, we thought we'd kick this week off first thing on a Monday morning with a, with a podcast. Um, just to sort of recap, Dave, a few weeks back, we recorded a podcast on service through the pandemic. So we talked a lot about customer service um, and how some organisations are getting it right. Uh, in fact, a lot of organisations are getting it right and showing empathy and, and showing great levels of service and how maybe a few organisations were getting it wrong. Um, mm. We also talked about the difference between service and customer experience. So the fact that the service is quite a transactional, responsive thing, but the customer experience is, is fundamentally how a customer feels uh, after leaving an interaction uh, with their supplier. So yeah, it was a really good debate, but it was more on the humanistic side of service, wasn't it, Dave? And I think what we wanted yeah. to do is we wanted to record a part two. And the part two is very much going to move it forward a little bit in, um, you know, because you wrote that great paper that's available on the hub around all of this. But part two was it's not just the human element that, that delivers great service through it at this time. It's actually the technological aspect of service as well. You know, the technology that we use these days and how consumers are being used to self-serving, et cetera. And, and, and before you transitioned into the technology piece, Dave, you wrote a conundrum. And I'm just going to read a little mm-hmm. bit of the conundrum out and then I'll bring you straight in. So this, this is what you wrote. You wrote, how can a business provide world-class service through COVID-19 when their service handler, handler headcount is being massively reduced because people are either being fell out or... You know, they're isolating. Yep. The business themselves have a reduced income because everybody's struggling at this time. And whilst all of that's happening, they've got an unprecedented amount of incoming from customers who are worried, right? Who want, who want to put accounts on, you know, freeze their accounts and they want to take payment holidays and they want to know what their what it means for their summer holiday, etc. So the, it's this conundrum of unprecedented incoming but we've got we're, we're significantly inhibited in our ability to actually service people, and that's where the technology aspects for those companies who have who are ahead of the game. That's where this can really come in, right? Yeah, absolutely, it is for sure. Um, and I think this is a it's a much um, bigger topic and subject than just you know what we're facing at the moment with the restrictions in the world. You know, I think going forwards, um, I think it's going to be vital. Uh, to a, a business's success in terms of service and with customer support, that they transition from being heavily um, humanistically based in call centres to much more technologically uh, focused. Yeah, absolutely. And the and, and the, the companies who got ahead of the game five years ago or so, Dave, with some of this technology are probably reaping the benefits right now. And there's some organisations who have learned from COVID-19 who they'll probably have to uh, invest uh, in their technology from a service perspective going forward, should anything like this happen again. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, as I said, I don't think it's just about these one-off situations. I think it's going to be about um, customer demand. Yeah. You know, there's the, there's definitely the, um, you know, the first part of, uh, I guess, of the white paper that I wrote, um, it sort of highlights what customers uh, are demanding generally now. Um, just the very fact that it's going to be really, really helpful in the current situation 
it, it's just kind of coincidental, I guess. But um, well, that's the, that's that's backed up, Dave, by a stat that you put in your paper. So I remember you you wrote, which we you know you're a stickler for old school service with a human being on the yes, end. Yes, I am. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but even yeah. even you're coming round to the stats, which is you know uh, now more than ever customers are 25 percent less likely to want to speak to somebody than five years ago mm. um they, and, and this is the stats and i'll just sort of build up in the, on this and bring you in so but if that's the case then what is the most important attribute of customer experience today well there's an array of percentages here when when multiple people were surveyed by a global company so 23 percent they need easy to use tools for service and they're online tools mm. um 28% people want multiple contact points. They don't just want one avenue or one channel. Yeah. Um, 37% want a person to speak with. So that, that's dropped, as you say, 25% less. It's down to 37%. Only 37% of people want an actual human being to speak to. Mm-hmm. 52% want their staff, who they do speak to, to have uh, the required knowledge. Um, 55% consistency across all channels. But here was the big winner of this survey. 75% of people just want a fast response time. So speed, speed and a, a response, whether that's through a chat bot or a live chat or a technology or a website or whatever it might be, that now trumps speaking to a human being, which is quite fascinating. Yeah, it really is. Um, we talk an awful lot about generations, don't we, uh... You know, when mm. when we're in the normal swing of things, you know, we talk about millennials and Gen Zs and all the rest of it. And I think there's definitely a pattern to this as well. Um, you know, as you mentioned earlier on, I'm a bit of a stickler for service. You know, I like to speak to a human, but I like to speak to a really good quality human who knows the the ins and outs of, you know, every possible scenario that I might give to them. But they can also solve the problem that I'm going to present to them as well. Yeah, that's all. That's also getting less and less. Um so, so what what needs to happen as as generations move forward is that uh, like like my son's generation, he's nineteen. He doesn't want to speak to a, an operator because it takes too long. He just wants the ability to find the answer, uh, you know, either on his smartphone or his or his laptop really quickly. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense, and it backs it's backed up by another another stat in your paper, which is around the consumer behaviour. I think it was yeah. a study by Dimension Data. You know, 40% of consumers now prefer to self-serve, which means I don't want my organization, my supplier to do it for me. I want to be able to Mm self-serve, you know, based on my provider giving me the platform to do so. Um, And and another stat in that in that segment also says that 73% of customers prefer to use a company's website, official website. Uh, So, you know, instead of live chat and chat and some of the clever stuff that we can talk about it in a second, but basically I want a reliable uh, company website that I can trust, that I can go to and self-serve. And that's what people want right now in terms of service. And yeah. yet it's amazing how, you know, as we'll come on to again, how most organizations, websites are not equipped to allow their consumers to self-serve in an effective way. Yeah, it really is. Um, there's there's a little bit uh, more about mobile technology in a little while, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, but it, it is interesting because um, the the primary section that people are wanting to be of high quality are the uh, frequently asked questions section. So you know you've seen it, we've all seen it. You know on a website, FAQs. Click on there, type in an answer. Uh, it gives you the wrong answer, and then it says, "Was this helpful?" <laughs> so you click on no so it comes up with a, another thing that wasn't helpful either um the problem with that is that's just going to frustrate customers more so you're not getting to a solution and it's decreasing the experience as opposed to increasing and it's making the whole thing uh, slower rather than faster because we're still gonna have to get on the telephone and try and speak to a human yeah and, and so and, and the numbers dave the numbers are backing up the frequently asked question uh, case, you know, the data in just three years, the numbers have gone through through the roof, you know, you know mm. in terms of the read count, frequently asked questions pages from 2017 to 2019, it's gone from 53,000 to almost 340,000. And, and, and that's, mm. that's showing that 
that self-service demand that we're talking about. People want to go onto a website. What my question must be a frequently asked question. Let me go onto the FAQ page and I want to be able to, in 30 seconds, find my question and get a succinct answer. So for those organizations who are really investing in a really simple, and it's not re very revolutionary as an FAQ page, it's, it's been around for some time, Dave. It's just that it's yeah. just that the need to use them is now greater than it was 15 years ago. You know, the, like you said, the generations 15 years ago did couldn't be bothered to, to go through the frequently asked question page. They want to speak to a human. Whereas now, mm. people want the succinct answer and to be able to self-serve. So the dynamic shift, and that's where a good FAQ page can now really pay off for organizations. Yeah, and this is the, this is the key point here. You know, most websites have got the FAQ section. Um, but the question is, how good is the quality? You know, did it actually fulfill the customer's needs? Did it answer the question that they had? Now, of course, the, the, some, there is a little bit of a clue in the title, frequently asked questions. If you've got a question that's maybe not asked as frequently, you might struggle. You might have to get onto the phone to a human. But I, I guess, the, you know, the, the, the data in the FAQ section it, it is only as good as the stuff that's put in at the back end. So we do need humans to put it in at the back end so the self-serve interface can do what it needs to do, yeah. right? And and that's and the and the information that's being put in the back end is only as good as your data collection. So, so you need to have a really, really effective way of monitoring frequently asked questions. Uh, and mm. and monitoring the successful answers that are given by human beings over the phone that satisfy and fulfill customers' needs to be able to input the right data in the first place. So there's a couple of things going on here. It's not about creating a page and coming up with a lot of FAQs. It's about no. it's about the input of the of the data, but it's about the collection of that data in the first place so it's accurate and helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think, um, you know, if we put this question to any business that we work with, um, there, there are only a, a finite amount of things that customers come to you with. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not, it, you know, the spectrum is not vast uh, in terms of the amount of customer problems or customer questions. It's actually quite finite. So, you know, as long as we can put some, some, um, some data and some evidence and, you know, some, some smart program into that FAQs, then I don't think there's any reason why it shouldn't be good quality. Yeah, absolutely. So FAQ pages are really important. And you know what? It would be staggering if you if you went on a number of websites uh, uh, and, the, and they haven't got them, right? And, and don't get me wrong, right? Mm. You know, there'll, be, there'll be more, there'll be different organizations who need them more than others. So if you're very much a service-led organization, you might need FAQs, but maybe not as much as if you're a, a, a large global retailer shipping products every, every day. Because somebody like Apple or Amazon are going to have far more questions about products and and stuff that are, are, are arriving than than maybe um, you know a, a solicitor, for example, who's providing a service. Mm. I mean, there's still a requirement for FAQ, but you get my point. Some are going to need it more sure. than others, but everybody should have one really. And it's proven that if you know if if seventy three percent of people want to self serve, then we're missing a trick if we haven't got one. Um, Let's move it on, Dave. You mentioned something earlier that I just want to revisit. You mentioned mobile. Now, you mm. wrote something in this yeah. paper that blew my mind. Um, <laughs> probably blew your mind when you were researching it. Yeah, it really did. Yeah, but, it really did. you wrote yeah. optimized for mobile use. So if people want to use websites and they want to self-serve and they want to, you know, have a speed of response, then most of them are going to do it via a mobile device because that's the way we operate in the modern day world, whether that's an iPad or an iPhone, right? Um, mm -hmm. but here was a global study carried out by Basekit. So the global study found that 91%, that's 91% of all major business websites are not either configured for or optimized to be mobile friendly. Now, Wow. If that's true, which obviously you've researched and it's and it's a it's a data point out there in the industry, I, I actually believe it. And and it's not about having a good website. What it says there, it's not configured for or optimized properly mm. for mobile to be mobile friendly. So it means that when you're yeah. viewing the website on on your mobile phone, it, it there's there's things out of kilter and buttons don't work and mm. 
pages can't be displayed properly and and that therefore people are not going to be able to navigate and, and use it 91 percent days mm. yeah i know yeah and you're right i was absolutely staggered i, I sort of reread it probably two or three times to make sure i'd got the the numbers and the context right um i mean i mean the important point to make is that it, what it's not saying is it's not saying that you can't access these websites via mobile devices you can what it's saying is they don't necessarily work as well as they would on your mobile device as if you access them on a PC or a, you know, an Apple Mac or something like that, which, as you rightly, uh, rightly say, is, is frustrating for a customer. You know, if you're trying to select something from a menu and it doesn't work or the FAQ section keeps going around in loops, you know, or you can't find the contact number because it's not displayed correctly or the spacing's not right then all it does is lead to a worse experience for the customer as opposed to a better one. Yeah, and that's it. And, and because we are an impatient generation, uh, and, and, you know, like we said there, um, you know, speed of response and me being able to self-serve quickly is the number one most important thing for us, then messing mm -hmm. around with a mobile device and a website that's not functional is only going to wind me up and add to frustration. So a really good, a really good yeah. takeaway from this, if anybody's listening to this and you, you have... Uh, service facilities on your website or you have frequently asked questions pages or you can you have a submission area or a live chat facility just go check it out on your mobile device go, go on that customer journey and just make sure it's optimal for use because it doesn't it probably wouldn't cost a lot of money to uh, optimize uh, or configure your website for mobile use we've done it ourselves with the t2 hub dave you know it wasn't a great deal yeah. of work it took a bit of tweaking and things need changing on the mobile view. But, you know, it was one of the mm -hmm. things we did rigorously because we had an appreciation that a lot of people would be on the fly and using the hub on their phone. So we needed to be able yeah. for, it to, for it to work, you know, optimally. So, yeah, it's a staggering mm -hmm. percentage. And I think if you've done all the hard work of giving your clients these tools to sell set, but you've just fallen short because you haven't configured for mobile use, it's a schoolboy error, really, Dave. It's a, it's a small error but with a potentially big impact on your business. Mm, absolutely it is, yeah. Yeah, 100% it is. Uh, and interestingly, I guess, uh, it kind of the, there is another um, sort of category in there around um, self-service, around things like screenshots, videos, audio, all that type of thing, diagrams, step-by-step instructions. They're not going to work if they're not configured properly for, for mobile. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, fi final part then, Dave, final bit. I'll, I'll bring you in straight here. You did a mm. bit of work on cost versus return. So um, it was sort yeah. of like around what is the potential benefits of automation of service versus having those contact centers, those humans, those the old way of doing things. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, having a, a contact center is a costly business, you know, um, as you know, I've got a little bit of a, a, a contact center background. Um, so, you know, it's not just wages, it's, it's, um, it's buildings, it's equipment, it's technology, you know, it's the maintenance, it's servers, it, it's a whole, whole bunch of work. It really is. Um, so, so, I mean, you know, we've had a couple of these conversations with some of our customers around, you know, the, the, the switch to technology and away from actual human phone contact and the very first thing they say is well yeah but have you seen the cost of this stuff yeah. well yeah i've seen the cost of this stuff but have you seen your running costs and people tend to ignore ignore them because they're budgeted for and it's just part of the everyday running cost but but as a base example if you take a business um that is has got about a thousand service calls a week which uh, it probably isn't an awful lot you know it's probably a medium to large size business a thousand service calls a week. Um, and this is the difference between using tech and using people. Um, you could pretty much save around half a million pound a year by transferring about 80% um, of the work to technology and taking it away from humans. So, I mean, if you just figure that out over the space of one year, a business, a medium to large business could save half a million quid on its customer contact costs i mean what yeah. does that mean oh it means a huge amount on the bottom line um and, and like you say the, the the upfront costs of the setup might be 
a, of a significant amount in terms of the tech and the configuration. And but, mm, but once sure. it's there, the year on year benefits is it is phenomenal. But don't forget as well, it's not just the cost reason why we're, why we're suggesting this. We've presented the way the world is going, the way the generations uh, are engaging with with their suppliers and from from a consumer perspective. It's almost like you've got no choice, but it's also a no-brainer. That's sort of what we're saying here. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's my least favourite saying in the world. It's yeah. a win-win. Exactly, exactly. And this is from, I will say this, Dave is the most uh, old-fashioned customer service stickler on the planet. He, he, he loves loves engaging <laughs> with a human being, getting great service, leaving a tip and going away delighted. But I think there is a recognition, Dave, 2020 and beyond, Um you know, yes, if we go into restaurants, yes, if we go into into gyms, into leisure facilities, you know, we're still going to mm. interact with humans and we're going to have that in many industries. Sure. However, in most other industries and certainly in industries where organisations are responding to consumer questions, technology is going to come in. In the retail sector, it's going to it's it's paramount importance now. Um as, a, as an example, but in most sectors, people are going to want to self-serve in a quick and timely fashion via technology. That's what the data and trends are saying. And, and, and what we've presented here today, Dave, is, you know, some of them astonishing stats, but finished off with, you know, you haven't got a choice, but it's also a no brainer because not only can you transform your business, but you can start um, put, taking out a load of cost and putting a load of profit on the bottom line as well. I mean, don't get me wrong there's disasters if you don't get the right technology and you have to rip it all out and start again i mean there's some horror stories out there mm -hmm. where you know you can spend hundreds of thousands of pounds if not millions and it goes wrong right but um mm. that's what there's a lot of advice out there a lot of consultancy out there to help you get it right but um you've got to start thinking about service moving forward is your organization set up to provide the consumer or the client with the ability to self serve in a quick and timely fashion, because that's what the trends and the data are saying. Absolutely, and looping back to our very first point, just just considering those costings for a moment, looping back to the very first point that that according to the the um, study that was carried out last year, forty percent of all customers actually choose and prefer self service over human contact. So, not only are you becoming much more efficient as a business by saving some cash on the costs? You're actually pleasing 40% of your, your basic customer yeah. base. Yeah, and, and I always I always look at it from a disaster disaster perspective as well. If you look at COVID-19, for example, those organisations who did this five to ten years ago uh, have found it much easier to continue the high level of service throughout COVID than the ones who didn't. So... You know, yeah. the ones who haven't and they're still heavily reliant on 100 people sat in a call centre on a dialer. Mm. And when they found out that mm. they cannot uh, they cannot transition that technology to people's homes and have them uh, answer the same volume of calls, they've really struggled in this in this pandemic. So, you know, it's just another thing to think about going forward. I'm not saying we're going to have you know, a, 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 an outbreak every five years, but there's all sorts of different scenarios that could affect your ability to, to operate. Mm. And if you've got the right technology in place, you're going to be, your impact is going to be less than it would be for those who are doing nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Dave, fascinating. Love that. Really good podcast. And I think it's a good part to, to the one that we put on the hub two weeks ago, which was the human element of service through the pandemic. This was more transitioning into the technology. We talked about it more in general terms, not just in the pandemic day, but it's an important point, point, important point to make because I think the COVID-19 situation has highlighted the, the, the yes, risks of has, not yeah. having some of this in place. Yeah, sure. Dave, that was great, that, mate. Thank you very much. for, for, for It's a great paper. If somebody wants to go and get the pathway off the website, um, it'll be on the T2 Hub. Uh, I think Lydia is just... Uh, fit finalizing it and uh, dotting the i's and crossing the season up, going on the hub this week, I think. So, uh, we can certainly point people mm -hmm. to that. But other than that, Dave, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be back pleasure. again next week, probably, Dave, with another T2 Hubcast. So, Dave, thank you very much, mate. Cheers. Thanks a lot.